as far as I saw, I'm the only person talking about preclinical uh, models um, of uh, psychedelics. So, uh, yeah, and it's also a very late stage of, of the conference, so I hope you are still all uh, awake <laughs> and um, ready to receive some, some new inputs. So uh, I brought some, some data from, from uh, some pictures uh, also from uh, where I come from. So uh, Mannheim lies in the Rhein-Neckar Delta, so between the rivers Rhine and, and Neckar. So it's a very beautiful area. We have lots of uh, um, architecture from, from the Baroque time, so like the, the castle of Mannheim where the university is located. And uh, in the heart of Mannheim, we have the Central Institute of Mental Health, uh, where I work. And it's a psychiatric hospital with uh, a strong focus on, on research, so both preclinical and, and also clinical research. So, and that's, that's the nice thing about the Central Institute, so that we have patients coming in and um, we have this nice translational possibility to, to do both animal research and find any findings we have, we can easily kind of translate to, to the patient. So um, as mentioned, um, I will talk about uh, psilocybin today especially, and uh, we just have some really fresh data uh, from, from our lab um, evaluating the effects of uh, psilocybin on relapse behavior of uh, alcohol-dependent rats. And that will be uh, my main focus uh, today. So yeah, why are we doing uh, addiction research and, and also on, with a focus on, on, on alcohol? So we know that, that the harmful use of uh, alcohol costs more than 2.5 million deaths per year. And uh, also according to um, this graph, alcohol is also um, the third largest risk factor worldwide for um, premature mortality, disability, and uh, loss of health. And the main problem of alcoholics is uh, not to stop drinking. It's more that they can't abstain from alcohol for a longer period of time. So this relapse process is, is one of the key elements we are focusing on our research. So alcohol dependence develops over a long period of time, as I just mentioned before, and you have initial alcohol use and uh, multiple cycles of uh, craving and relapse. Then you have, again, abstinence phases. Then this develops into heavy use and uh, might lead in late dependence. And these multiple cycles of relapse are thought to induce neuroadaptations in the brain, mainly found in the prefrontal cortex, the nucleus accumbens, VTA, and in late stages also uh, the amygdala. And since these relapse processes are a key element in, in the cause of addiction, we focus our uh, research and also relapse medication uh, according to, to do relapse prevention. But how does it look? Uh, how does this relapse prevention develop? Uh, in the history of, uh, of treatment. So that's what I wanted to, to go through with you. So <clears throat> in the 16th century, very interesting, there was this edict from uh, Francois I, and uh, he said that anybody who appeared in public in a state of intoxication should on the first occasion be imprisoned on bread and water. So I'm not sure if this could be feasible today. We would need a big prisons. <laughs> But um, yeah, 16th century, and uh, also on the second occasion, uh, chased with a whip. On uh, the third occasion, um, flogged in public. And um, on the fourth, or further relapses, um, would have an, um, cut an ear off. So that's uh, in the 16th century. The 17th century was um, more under the focus of uh, replacement therapy. So this is a, a famous picture uh, from William Hogarth. And um, the theory behind it was that uh, strong liquor such as gin, uh, which you see here in this picture. So this is a picture from Gin Lane was uh, bad for social life. So as you can see here, this woman uh, is not able to take care of her child and it falls down the stairs. And uh, this 
replacement theory was from hard liquor such as gin towards uh, a very nice and happy environment uh, which they termed beer street. So they said that liquor, which is, uh, it contains less alcohol, uh, is better than, uh, than uh, gin, for example. The 18th century, uh, God came into play, so many believed in God and uh, was, uh, I would say, under the focus of, of uh, salvation uh, as prevention therapy. And talking about therapy in the 19th century was, uh, was the first indication from uh, Thomas Trotter with his essay on drunkenness. And um, yeah, so here in this, this case, relapse prevention uh, was starting to be a psychological undertaking, or he stated that this habit of drunkenness is uh, a disease of the mind. Then uh, 19th century is uh, the time when first pharmacological agents uh, were on the market uh, for the treatment um, of alcohol dependence or relapse treatment. Antabus, I don't know if, uh, if one of you uh, heard of that. So. Basically, it blocks the metabolism uh, of, of ethanol to acetate, and um, so what happens in the body that uh, acetaldehyde uh, accumulates in the body, and um, that is uh, responsible for all these unpleasant or hangover effects uh, from alcohol. So uh, basically, patients uh, should take the medication, and in case they relapse, they would. Uh, observe all these unpleasant effects of alcohol, and the theory was that they would stop drinking in this case. But uh, as this and many other uh, studies I show here, um, they all didn't really find support that abstinent rates went down with, with antibus. So what is the actual state of the art? Um, as I mentioned, antibus or disulfiram, uh, is available, then we also have uh, naltrexone working on, on the opioid system. We have uh, camprosate as in uh, working on the GABAergic system to inhibit this excessive glutamate release, which is thought to have an implication on, on relapse. And then uh, in the last years also nalmefen uh, came uh, out. It was, uh, yeah, everyone had a great promise on nalmefen because it was, should, uh, have be a revolution in that sense, as you could use it as as needed to reduce alcohol uh, use. But overall, all of these four uh, treatments, um, efficacy has been shown to be really poor for all four of them. So also, yeah, in that terms, prescription numbers are going down. Many uh, clinics don't really uh, use these uh, pharmacological medita medications. So. It's not really uh, satisfying. So what is the future? Um, yeah, as we are here today, uh, of course, the answer can be uh, psychedelics. So the problem in Germany uh, is only that uh, we are not at that stage to, to really perform uh, clinical trials on psychedelics because there's uh, still a huge gap of knowledge and uh, on the mode of action and also the safety issues. So the regulatory bodies, so it's, it's not really possible at the moment in Germany. So that's why uh, we thought it would be um, really important to uh, look at psilocybin from a preclinical side. And uh, it was really nice that we received this year uh, funding from the European Union in this uh, Neuron uh, Eranet EU um, Foundation, and uh, we established this uh, PCI consortium, which started in May this year, and uh, we have four partners within this PCI consortium. We are located in Mannheim, then we also have a site in uh, Italy and France, and uh, one clinical partner in Zurich. And uh, we all focus on the mode of action of psilocybin in alcohol addiction. And we have uh, many work packages within uh, our consortium. Uh, four work packages related to preclinical work, and then uh, the fifth in uh, Zurich, um, which investigated or investigates the effects of, of psilocybin uh, on alcohol addicted patients. And we'll look at, at fMRI. So basically, since we're very curious, uh, about the effects on relapse in animals, we uh, 
did a first work package where we want to investigate uh, does psilocybin have an action on the relapse process of alcohol addicted rats. In a second step, we will uh, look in close detail on the mode of action. So, I mean, a lot of uh, research has been done to show that 5-HC2A receptors are activated. We see glutamate release. But what is beyond this first action on the brain? So what happens on a molecular level with 5-HC2A receptors, with glutamatergic receptors, with the dopamine system? So this is uh, kind of what we are at the moment uh, working on, also looking at gene expression changes, metabolomics in the omics field. So there are lots of things going on. Um, because we know, I mean, we have seen in all the depression, depression studies that treatment outcome, I mean, after six, months of, uh, after six months of treatment, you still see an effect of treatment. So there must be a kind of long-term mechanism, yeah, which what happens in the brain to, to, or altered in the brain. And um, that's why there must be anything on the molecular side uh, working in order to, to have an, an altered state. So that's why one part also focuses on uh, epigenetic alterations, if that's a possible mechanism. And uh, then we want to compare the human fMRI data to, to, to the preclinical. Okay, so what is our primary hypothesis for uh, psilocybin administration in relapse? So um, we stated for, for our behavioral study that psilocybin administration resets the brain and leads to a reduction of relapse behavior. And uh, why we think that it might help to reduce uh, relapse is uh, the following. So we have a groundbreaking work from, from Peter et al., uh, which looked at the prefrontal cortex. And they found that specific regions of the cortex, mainly the dorsal part of the medial prefrontal cortex, they uh, seem to promote drug seeking. And um, other parts, like the ventral parts of the prefrontal cortex, they kind of act like a break or like a stop signal. So these areas are really there to stop behavior and especially um, to stop drug seeking and relapse. And on the right side, we can see uh, work from, from our lab, and what we found was basically that uh, we found a set of neurons within this break area, so within this infralimbic area, we found a set of neurons which work together, we call them ne neuronal ensembles, so they fire together during the process of drug seeking, so when they're presented to cues related to the drug, these specific neurons fire and stop their uh, behavior in normal animals, whereas when we delete Specifically, these neurons, we see an increase in drug seeking and relapse. So, and the theory behind psilocybin treatment would be, as uh, you saw uh, over the days from, from these theories about what happens when you give psilocybin, you have uh, new network connections. So we thought it could be that in our alcohol-dependent rat model, we will have a redistribution of neuronal ensembles, a new network created so that this break is possible and to uh, kind of, that the rats are able to abstain from alcohol and reduce their relapse risk. Okay, so um, how does our model look like? So it's called the alcohol deprivation effect and basically it consists of three phases. So we have uh, a first phase of uh, alcohol drinking, so the rats can drink alcohol for a period for up to one year so this is uh, kind of their baseline drinking. They can drink as they want. They also have uh, water. So, and uh, this phase is followed by a deprivation phase. So uh, at some point, we take out the water bottle, and uh, they go into withdrawal. And in their abstinence period, this lasts between two and four weeks. And within this abstinence period, we uh, then did drug treatment with psilocybin. And after treatment, we uh, reintroduced the alcohol bottle and uh, the rat could decide, do I want to relapse or not? Okay, so just for you how, uh, to see how this data looks like. So as I mentioned, you have this first phase where you have baseline consumption of the rats followed by this abstinence phase. And within this abstinence phase, uh, 
we did uh, psilocybin treatment and uh, then um, we have relapse, which looks like this. So they have a high increase of alcohol drinking up to six grams per kilogram pure ethanol, what they consume. So that's just for you an impression. So six grams per kilogram when you relate it to, to the human condition, that's like two bottles of vodka. So they are really drunk and really drink uh, a lot of alcohol. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have uh, fresh data from the lab on this relapse behavior. <clears throat> so initially we did uh, two applications within seven days, uh, which is, uh, yeah, we kind of wanted to mimic the human condition from Bogenschutz where they also did two treatments and we used a moderate and a high dose. So 2.5 milligram per kilogram and 10 milligram per kilogram and um, then we reintroduced the alcohol bottles and, and looked at relapse. Okay, so here we have the baseline values, then the abstinence phase with uh, the two treatments, and then we have the relapse. And as you can see, psilocybin 2.5 milligram and also 10 milligram had basically no effect. So vehicle is just a saline application and uh, Psilocybin could not reduce relapse in, in male rats, and the same we also find for, for females. So we have uh, baseline values, um, abstinence, and, and relapse. So in both males and females, there's no effect of psilocybin on relapse behavior. We did uh, another study because we thought microdosing might be uh, something interesting. <laughs> and um, so what we did during this abstinence period, uh, we applied every three days a microdose of, of psilocybin and then also again looked at relapse behavior. So, but again, uh, similar to, to the two high doses, we saw no effect. So between vehicle and, and microdosing, there's no effect either in male or in female rats. Okay, so um, in uh, conclusion, of course, this, this data uh, are against the hypothesis we have. But uh, what is really nice is that this is kind of a pure pharmacological efficacy study we, we performed here. And uh, when we look at all the human studies, it was, uh, all of them had assisted psychotherapy or any psychological support. So uh, the study was really focusing on the pure pharmacological effect. And it's really nice to see that, okay, there's no effect, but then the supports, of course, the hypothesis that setting is important, psychological support needs to be done in order that psychedelics might work. So of course the next day, it's, as I mentioned, mode of action is, is currently running. We will also compare it to, to other substances like LSD, ketamine, MDMA, and the translational studies we are also performing in the fMRI will hopefully then, uh, then provide uh, sufficient data to maybe also do clinical trials in, in Germany. Yeah, so these are the people I want to thank from our uh, group, also from the Molecular Neuroimaging group I'm part of, and our uh, ERANET partners. So thank you. Of course, it's hard to, to do that in rats, so that might be one possible explanation. And um, of course, we are aware of the, the limitations, but uh, yeah, as I mentioned, it's so the study we tried to really look at the pure pharmacological effects, and everything else yeah, is either hard to model or can't be done in, in, in rats. It's true. I have two questions. Um, one, why did you separate males and females in your analysis? Do you have a hypothesis that males and females are different? Uh, no, there's no hypothesis, but I would say uh, from a historical point of view, all the animal literature focuses on males. So, and we are now aware that it's not good to only focus on male research. So we included the same uh, numbers of females in, in the study. But um, yeah, since a laboratory setting with animals wants to be really 
similar from day to day and you have variations in the estrocycle cycle of females, so you have to really account for that and that makes it difficult for female animal research, but still we want to include it, but you like to separate then males and females. Gotcha. And my second question is, how do you get rats to want to drink pure ethanol? Um. <laughs> <laughs> why, why would they want it? Yeah, so it's not pure. It's uh, what we show is the pure amount of alcohol, but they have uh, the choice between three bottles of alcohol. So they have 5% alcohol diluted in water, then they have 10% and 20%. And initially they, they start to drink 5% and then they continue with 10 and at the end, especially during the relapse phase, they, they, because of course they have a maximum amount of liquid they, they, they uh, drink. So they focus during relapse more on the 20% because they know after some time, this is the bottle which gives me most, uh, most alcohol. Yeah, I'm wondering if you're talking about the, the imperial abstinence, it seemed like quite low to me. And I'm wondering if you try other times, intervals, and do like, uh, you think this timing that you choose like, would have affected the rest of uh, you mean between drug treatment and relapse, or you mean in general? Yeah, so this is an established model. So we, uh, these two weeks, it doesn't matter. You can go up to six weeks and the, the relapse behavior will not change. So between two and six weeks, you have a kind of window where, where behavior is pretty stable. If you, there will be an abstinence for a longer period of time, this might change data, but between two and six weeks, you, you pretty much have uh, have uh, the same phenotype. Oh, and then related to this, like uh, on humans, like um, based on other studies, you know, maybe out there, I don't know, uh, what would be the best time to have, you know, a psychedelic session? Would it be during like a recovery phase, or would you more suggest during an acute stage? Ah, that's, that's a good question. That's what we are also thinking. So is this, did this, our hypothesis fail due to the time point of administration or was it because there was no psychological or no setting you know, around it? So we are also planning to do other applications. So during different times, during maybe also at baseline, can we manipulate baseline drinking and then further relapses? So, do we need alcohol on board or not? So there are still many questions, but yeah. of course, to translate those findings into the human condition is then again complicated. That's why we wanted to try to have uh, application which is close to the, to the human one, uh, which is published. How did you decide how much psilocybin to give a rat? And how do you know that there wouldn't be an effect if you made the dose a little bit higher or lower? So there are actually quite some studies, especially on drug discrimination. So looking at psilocybin, LSD, MDMA. So there's a lot of knowledge regarding the dosing. So uh, we knew that one milligram per kilogram is already, uh, they, you can see that the rats have some feelings. I mean, what you observe is head twitches. I don't know if you're aware of the preclinical literature. So you see head twitching behavior in these animals, which is pronounced with a higher dose. Also you have on startle, so uh, how much they, they freeze. So there is some literature uh, on, on psilocybin. So we knew that 2.5 milligram is already a high dose and 10 is a really high dose. So, so that was, uh, was known before, so that's why we, we choose these uh, doses and also the microdosing is kind of borderline dose, so we didn't want that they would have subject or subjective feeling, possible subjective feeling, so it's a kind of sub-threshold dose. So there's a lot of known regarding to, to, to the dosing based on drug dis discrimination.